Since its inception, this is only the second meeting of our society that I've been unable to attend. You will understand my disappointment that I cannot be with you in person today, especially on an occasion that is so important to me. I'm very grateful to Andy Schaefer, our president, and to Marty Liggett, our executive director, for making it possible for me to have this opportunity to speak to you, even in this less personal manner. Marty suggested that I might take a few minutes to share with you the secrets of my success. I'm afraid I have no such secrets, and it would seem self-serving to pretend that I do. Perhaps it might be more useful to explain why I became a hematologist and to acknowledge the many who have helped me in my exciting journey through medicine and science. When I was in medical school at the University of Chicago in the late 1940s, there were many interesting areas and wonderful challenges in medicine and science. But hematology was unique. One could secure the tissue needed and one could quantitate it. These features attracted the finest academically oriented physician scientists into the field. My mentor, Leon Jacobson, was a wonderful role model. I was proud to be permitted to associate with his fine group and to learn from them. I soon realized that outside my microcosm at the University of Chicago, there were many giants who would serve as lifelong role models. Among them were Clem Finch, Carl Moore, George Cartwright, and William Castle. These biomedical scientists were not only scholars, but true gentlemen. It was inspiring to know them as colleagues and friends. Support by my family has been critical, and I want especially to express my gratitude to Bonnie, my wife of 57 years, for un her unstinting enthusiasm for my work, for consoling me when things went wrong, and for the sacrifices that must be made by the wife of a man who has a second passion, science and medicine. My children, Steve, Earl, Bruce, and Debbie, began to believe that it was normal for their dad to hurriedly retreat to a study right after dinner to calculate regression coefficients on a mechanical calculator. I would have achieved little indeed had it not been for my collaboration with highly capable, loyal, and incredibly productive laboratory assistants. In the case of Wanda Kuhl, Terry Gelbert, Carol West, Linda Foreman, and Beryl Westwood, our work together spanned more than 16 years each. Collectively, just these five talented assistants worked with me for 125 years. Their contributions to the intellectual content of the work and contributions of others who were with me for only five to 15 years each have been major. Most of the lifetime achievements for which I'm being recognized are largely their due. There were also key professionals who contributed mightily to our productivity. George Dale, Joe Sorge, and Pauline Lee spent many years in our laboratory building their own careers in science while adding a new dimension to the work underway. In the clinical aspects of our work could not have moved forward without the combined clinical and laboratory studies of associates such as Carl Blume and Dennis Carson. Nowadays, much of the outstanding work in hematology is done by postdoctoral fellows, and that is a good thing, but we should remember that fellows are in the laboratory to be trained in science, not to be the workhorses of the research program. Moreover, Fellows cannot give the continuity that is so essential to long-term achievement. They must get on with their own independent careers. My pride in my fellows is what they have achieved after they have left my laboratory, not in what they achieved, no matter how important, when they were a part of my group. For example, Joe Pakal and Carl Blume have not only moved clinical and experimental hematology forward in very significant ways, but have provided our society with their time and leadership. Even though such success as I've enjoyed is due to many wonderful people who have worked with me for more than half a century, I want you to know how much it means to me personally to receive this recognition from colleagues whom I've learned to respect and admire over the years. There are many who would merit this award, and that you've chosen me has moved me deeply, more than I can really tell you in words. But apart from being chosen for this award by my colleagues, there is another aspect of this award that is very special to me. In the 1950s, when I first became a hematologist, quantitation of blood cells, one of the mainstays of our science, was done in counting chambers. I personally performed many such blood counts. Because of the relatively few cells that could be enumerated, there was a large statistical error. Indeed, the well-known Poisson distribution was based upon the error in counting blood cells. Wallace Coulter changed all of that. There is probably no one in this room who knows that I actually met this great man. That occurred when he wanted to test his revolutionary ideas in actual practice and sought out my mentor, 
Leon Jacobson at the University of Chicago. Coulter realized the great American dream. He built an industry that changed the way we practice hematology. Now his achievements support our work, not only scientifically, but also through generous philanthropy. It is therefore a very great privilege for me to accept an award bearing the Wallace Coulter name. Thank you very much.